Welcome to Is It Philosophy? Here we are the seekers of truth. We are the askers of the questions. We are the answerers of those questions? Maybe, I don't know. Each episode, myself and a guest or two will start with a question. Then we will set out on a journey to find an answer. In the end, it's up to you to determine, is it philosophy? Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Is It Philosophy? Today I'm joined with by Dennis Sumlin, who has a very interesting idea we're going to talk about today. Are we born with fear and hate? I love this idea because it's it plays right along with the other podcast I'm working on. So Dennis, what do you think? Are we born with fear and hate? Well, that's a question that is a very interesting one, which is why I'm glad to be able to address that question to you and your listeners. And so I would say we are born with, with fear, but not hate. How's that, Alex? Of course, I'm going to explain, but how's that answer for you? I like it. It's not the answer I would have given. I, I think that's very interesting because I would say the opposite. I'd say we're not born with fear or hate. So what brings you to this conclusion? Because fear is a natural mechanism that we're all born with in order to protect ourselves. That's really what fear is for. It's for, it's, it's, it's a biological thing uh, to protect ourselves because our human body and our psychology and everything is made up to preserve our own life. So it does everything it can do to stay alive. And so I think that fear is a basic instinct. So for example, you know, way back in the day before we had cars and internets, you know, it's good to be afraid in the woods because when, when it's dinner time and the lions are hungry, um, there's no chance to debate the political issues of the day. You got to get the hell out of there. And so fear, um, is useful in those base situations in order to preserve our life or protect us. So we are actually born with that instinct of fear that is to protect us. Uh, the problem is that we are taught to misuse fear and apply it to things that don't actually threaten us. I agree. So my question to you then is this, this idea of fear, going back to that, because I've got three kids. I'm sure you've got kids. When my kids were little, they had no fear. They they would be, they'd run off the edge of the couch and not even care they would play with everything, touch everything. My daughter played with the receptacles. She had a light she'd plug in and take out and plug in, take out. And my wife used to get onto her and I'm like, leave her. She'll, she'll get shocked once and she won't touch it again. And sure enough, but there was no fear of, of any of that. They would just mm -hmm. go. So what kind of fear are we talking about? Because to me, there's, there's different levels of fear, right? There's, there's phobias, which I've got a lot of them. And, and then there's fear of, Fear of the unknown, fear of of consequence. So, are we talking fear of consequence? Are we talking phobia? What are we What are we talking when you say fear? Well, that's, that's interesting that you should bring up the, the the kids and the risk taking. And I've taken some risks in my day too, so uh, I definitely understand you there. But I I think that the fear I'm talking about is a very base kind of fear. Like if you if you put your kids if they're old enough to to walk and understand things, you put your kids you know go back to the default lion representative, you put your kid there if they're old enough to put their hand in a socket, they're going to be old enough to run from the lion, so they're not gonna they may not stay around and put their finger in a lion's mouth, so at some level, their instincts are going to kick in and go, uh oh, I'm in danger, whereas around the common day house, things may not always appear like they're going to hurt you. Like, for example, if a kid puts their hand on the hot stove and they keep doing it and they keep doing it, and then sometimes you may have to, you know, I, I sometimes you know, I, I've heard of a, uh, you know, a mother kind of putting their kid's can where it would kind of burn to teach them not to do it. So that level of fear, the common everyday fear, don't put your hand here, don't put your hand there. Yes, you have to teach a kid not to do that. Um, but a stove is not the same thing as a lion. So I think we're talking about two different levels. You know what I mean? In other words, we are distinguishing between instinctual fear and, for lack of a better term, taught fear. Yeah. Because I, I know with, with my daughter, when she was little, my oldest daughter, she's eight now, but when she was little, she didn't care about spiders. She would play with spiders. She would look at spiders. She would she had all kinds of fun with the spiders for a while because I, I have really, really bad arachnophobia. I am terrified of spiders. And when she was little, she used to pick them up and bring them to me and show them to me and I tried really, really hard not to to show her that fear because I don't want I didn't want to teach my kids that fear. Yeah. 
But somehow or other, she wound up getting that phobia from me, I guess. I mean, that's all I can figure is I was able to teach it to her. Mm. So is that, I mean, obviously that's a a minor example compared to teaching grander scales of, of fear. Are we teaching children and the next generation greater fear, do you think? Yeah, I think when we start talking about taught fear, then that takes us into everything you're talking about and the grander things. Um, so it does start out, maybe if you had a reaction to the spider that you couldn't help, then she kind of took those cues. Because see, when you're young, when you're like zero to seven, I like to go through this little uh, three-stage developmental psychology thing, because when you're zero to six or seven, you're, you know, your mind is like a sponge. It kind of absorbs everything, even the littlest things, and makes it through. So if she's that age... And you're having reactions to spiders. She could pick that up. Yeah, it's interesting. I never, I never realized that. I, I must have been given cues. So, what are some of those grander things in your mind that we're we're teaching the the next generation, our kids, to to fear that are more dangerous? I, I, maybe not dangerous. Maybe that's the wrong word. But things that are having a bigger impact on them that are leading to the the taught hate. Well, I, there's a lot of different levels of fear. I mean, so. We're, we're taught fear of, of people that are different than us. We're, you know, and they break it down in these different categories. Don't, don't get near those people. Don't get near those people. Those people are bad. And so, you know, our culture teaches people to, you know, watch out for that, those particular people. So we've got that. And then we've got fear based on, for example, you know, my podcast is about, you know, men's personal development. So often we talk about, um, the fear that men have been taught to be open and transparent with with others and to share their more vulnerable feelings is a fear of that going on. Um, so there's a whole wide range of of taught fears. So my question though is are these are these taught fears or are these more instinctual fears? Because as as we developed, as society developed, as as mankind developed, men had to be stronger. Men had to be more emotionally stable because we had to go out and hunt. We had to go out and do the dangerous work. So you can't be emotional when you're you're hunting a tiger. You can't be emotional when you're trying to take down that woolly mammoth. The, the emotions don't help there. Whereas women needed that emotion. Women needed to be able to to feel deeper, to love and take care of the the young and have that connection. Is that not something you would say that is is sort of instinctual? Well, it depends on what you mean by emotional men. Because when I say emotional men, I don't mean, I don't mean women or I don't mean men that act like women. And, you know, so a man is, a man is not going to be as emotional as women. Some of that is biology. You know, some of that is, is the ratio between testosterone and estrogen. Some of that's bio- biology there. So when I talk about men being afraid to show their more vulnerable feelings, I'm definitely not suggesting that they be emotional all the time. That's not really what a, what a man is, you know, generally a man is, is, is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but I am talking about, you know, being able to release the stress when you need to, because what happens is that we are taught. I think some of this stuff is instinctual, as in men being the hunters and the providers and the women being nurturers. I think a lot of that is instinctual. But I also think that men are taught that you're never supposed to show feeling at all, ever. And as humans, we all have emotions. And so what happens is that men don't release their emotions at all. It's not even that they don't release it during the day or when they're hunting. You know, as you know, men now hold their emotions back in general, and then they end up taking it out on drugs and on on become a workaholic or alcohol or have anger problems. So there is a time and place for everything. And I think that Men have been taught that the instincts that you need to survive are instincts you should use all the time. And, and as humans, it's, I don't know if it's really realistic to ask someone to bottle up their emotions all the time. It's going to snap at some point. Oh, totally. I, I used to teach classes on men that have snapped, and I've, I've been one of those men myself. I think we all have that, that ability, and I think we all need to be able to, to access those greater, deeper emotions completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And back in the day, you know, it, it, I think what we do is we take the instincts that are natural to humans or natural to men and women. And we as humans, we try to go extreme with those instincts. So I agree with you that men have a particular kind of instinct to hunt, to provide, to protect. I'm, I'm with you there. I'm 100 percent. 
But I think that society takes that natural instinct to in an illogical conclusion. So I know this isn't our topic, but would you say that a lot of, of that stuff has contributed to this new I'm, – I'm probably going to get a lot of comments on this if I say this, but t- is contributing to this idea of toxic masculinity, of, of masculinity being dangerous and, and harmful and destructive because we've taken it to that extreme. We've given ourselves the, the ability or the right to let, let fear and that overcome to overtake us. And to become who we are to our core and not realize that we are compassionate, caring, loving men, women, individuals, human beings. And so that has contributed to this overwhelming desire to get rid of toxic masculinity or to claim everything, every male movement is a toxic masculinity thing. Yeah, I think what's going on now is a, what you say, a course correction and overcorrection is what I would call it, is that. We've been so locked into the other way for so long where men hasn't, haven't been allowed to make any moves outside of the archetype. And, you know, we, we had a lot of alcoholism, a lot of anger problems, workaholism, you know, domestic abuse. We had a lot of those things. And so now the culture is in this overcorrection stage. So we're going all the way the other way. Now it's toxic masculinity and, you know, and going to the extremes is not the way to achieve balance, of course. But I think that this is an unfortunate overcorrection. I also think that the name toxic masculinity is not really a good name for what parts of the culture are trying to communicate. I think that the toxic masculinity gives people the wrong impression about the message that's being communicated. No, I agree. So in your opinion, what would be a better thing that we could call it? Because I totally agree. I don't know what you can call it. I, I actually don't know what a good name would be because, you know, what I don't think, I mean, you certainly got some radical feminists out there who will say anything because they're hurt and scarred and whatever. But I really don't think most people that use the term toxic masculinity actually think that manhood or masculinity is bad. I think that they're objecting to the extreme behavior and the lack of accountability that some men show. But I don't think they think masculinity is bad. So I think there needs to be a better name for it. I don't know what the name should be. All right. Well, I'll throw that out to to you guys listening. In the comments, give us what you think we should call it. What should we change the name of toxic masculinity to? Maybe we'll we'll start a revolution on that, hopefully, because I'm in total agreement with you. I think the idea of calling something toxic masculinity gives a wrong impression. And I think that I read an article not too long ago that the title of it was, Is Toxic Masculinity Contributing to Global Warming? And I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Wow. You can find the article. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was wonderful. I That type of thing, and I don't know if it's because of the fact I used to teach family violence classes and I've seen the real vulnerability that men can have when they're in a supportive group of other men who are able and willing to accept their emotions as okay, but – Men are just as, as vulnerable. Men are just as, as willing to accept and acknowledge our emotions and live with those emotions as anybody else. But I think we have that fear, and I'm, I'm going back to this, our, our topic. I think we have that fear of judgment from society mm-hmm. and that fear of not fitting in if we do, for instance, cry at a movie. Y- yeah. And, and it's like this fear of everything because I, you know, I'm sure many men know that you know, when we grow, when we're growing up, we go through stages of getting teased. You know, we're not man enough if we're not tall. We're not man enough if we don't get enough women. We're not man enough if we don't, um, talk, our voice isn't deep enough. You know, we're not man enough if we don't earn enough money. We're not man enough if we cry. You know, so that's, this is what I mean about we have instincts, but yet society teaches us to push those instincts to an illogical conclusion. So I, I agree with you that we are afraid of judgment, what people might think. You know, what, what, what others think of our, our sense or level of manhood. So yeah, it's all run by fear. It's funny you say the, the men being afraid and, or should have that deeper voice. I spent so much time not starting a podcast at all because I was afraid of getting myself out there and having comments of like, Oh, that woman sucks at podcasting. (laughs) I was illogical totally, but I had that fear in my brain. So it's just. Funny that you say that. Yeah, I have, you know, I had that too. I'm, I'm not the voice thing, but the body thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a skinny dude, you know. Um, and so I've always had the fear that, well, well, women don't like skinny dudes. I'm, I'm skinny. I don't, you know, as, as women don't like skinny dudes, and you know, women want someone who's tall. I'm only five eight. Women want someone who's tall and muscular, and I'm not that. 
And so I was, a, you know, that made me a little bit afraid of talking to women and then thinking that I'm going to be with somebody because, you know, I'm, I don't, you know, so I understand. So let's switch to that for a second. Let's talk about fear and hate of, of body shaming because there's a huge movement right now of, of the acceptance of all body types, right? The, the plus size movement has become huge and, and all of these plus size models and actresses and actors are, are getting huge notoriety now because they are coming out with these messages of accepting yourself and not hiding away who you are, not being afraid of, of judgment. Is that a good thing? Should we be striving for more inclusion, more acceptance of every type? Or are we, are we setting ourselves up for another pendulum swing as we did with masculinity back to the opposite side? Well, I mean, I, I think we had this, we've had, we're having the same thing that we're, we're talking about body shame. So I think the pendulum swung this way for inclusion um, because it was so far the other way of total exclusion. Like you said, everyone had to look like Ken and Barbie and that's not real. And so we had to fix that because a lot of people aren't looking like Ken and Barbie. So, and, it, and you shouldn't feel shame in yourself because you don't look like Ken or Barbie. Why should you feel shame in that? You shouldn't feel shame in yourself because you're not the, the muscular guy with his shirt off on the beach. You don't look like that. You know, you shouldn't be shamed because, well, you know, you, the guys in the locker room may look a little lower hanging than you do. Like, there's nothing to be ashamed of. But this culture has made it so that we are ashamed of our bodies if we don't fit the archetype. So now we're in this stage of we should accept every body type. So I ask you, what do you think the danger is in accepting every body type? I don't know if there's a danger so much as it stops. For me, I'm, I'm a big dude. I'm 350 pounds, 6'4". I am by no stretch of the imagination muscular in that 350 pounds. But for me, it's if, if you accept certain body types. My wife watches this show, uh, My 600 Pound Life. And I don't know if we're so far that accepting, but I think if we start accepting people, I really don't want to sound like an asshole when I say this, but I, I think we're setting ourselves up for a society of very unhealthy, very lazy, I guess for a lack of a better term, people by accepting every shape, every size, every everything, because the human body isn't meant to be overly obese. There are certain levels of, of fit and, and shape that are a range. But I think as we get more accepting of the bigger and the bigger and the bigger, we become more and more unhealthy and we put ourselves and our, our bodies and our mortality at risk. And I know I'm going to get comments. I'm sorry. I'm an asshole. I just, I don't <laughs> know that we necessarily should be accepting of every uh. body type out there. So then what is, what's the, so you tell me, I have an answer for you that I have my own opinion. I, I don't have an answer. I have my own opinion. But what do you think the solution is then? How, what, when do we start saying your body's no good? And how do we communicate that? See, I don't know. I don't know that we should say your body's no good. I think it should be more of, are you, do you feel healthy? Do you feel like you sh are as active as you want to be? Are you able to do all the things in your life that you want to do? And I think that is where we set that standard. If you're so unhealthy, and you can be unhealthy and be thin too. I'm not saying this as just a fat people thing because I'm a fat people, but we we can be unhealthy and not be able to do the things that we want to do. And I think that's where we draw that line. If, can you go outside and play soccer with your kids? Can you go outside and, and walk around the neighborhood with your kids? If you can't, then I don't know that you should be accepting of that body type, whatever it is, super thin, super fat, whatever. I think that's where that, that line should be drawn is, are you able to live the life that you want to live? Well, um, we're up against something here. And it's, this, is, this is another natural human instinct. It was, since we saw the show talking about human instincts, one of the human instincts that we have is to defend ourselves and protect ourselves. And so I think that when the culture attacks people for being different, the natural instinct is to defend oneself. It causes a counterculture when the mainstream culture is, you know, judgmental. And you know, the message is about, you know, you're fat, so you're unhealthy and you're ugly because you're fat and people don't want to date you because you're, so it just creates a defense mechanism. Sure. And so I'm wondering how can we communicate it's healthy to be healthy, but not shame anyone if they just so happen not to be that way. I think it comes down to compassion, and empathy for everybody to, to put something out there for everybody that might offend somebody. But I happen to be Buddhist and I wholeheartedly believe in compassion and empathy for everybody, every type, every creature. 
And I think that's what we aren't teaching the next generation, or hopefully we are now. I'm trying to teach to my kids. But the idea of compassion and empathy and understanding for everybody, I don't think we should go out there and point our fingers and, and laugh at the the people on the 600-pound the show that my wife watches. Those people are, are human just like us. They're empathetic. They're compassionate. They deserve respect just like everybody else. For me, it's it's the idea of not striving to to get that healthy lifestyle. All those people on that show, I've watched a couple episodes with my wife. Most of those people on those shows are miserable because they can't do anything. And I think shaming them only puts that further down that spiral. Oh, like you said, it, it causes that them to need to defend it. And when you're defending it, then you make those decisions, those bad choices even more because these are my choices. I'm defending my choices. I have to keep making these choices. I think that's where the that should change is is compassion and empathy for everybody. Oh, I'm, I'm definitely with you. And um, m- my belief system is, I wouldn't say it's, I used to be a practicing Buddhist. And um, my belief system currently is, you know, it, Buddhism would be the closest word I would use for people to understand it in, a, in, a, in an instant. So, yeah, we're pretty much pretty much on the same page with that for the most part. So that's cool. Um, and I'm just wondering what, what the answer is. How do we communicate a healthy body, a healthy lifestyle without moving into shame and without creating archetypes? Because, you know, when you see the media and TV and whatever, they got the archetypes. They got the perfect man, the perfect woman, the perfect body. You know, you. so how do we get people to let their defenses down and make genuine decisions for their health, but at the same time, not shoving the perfect body in their face as if they're somehow intrinsically flawed? I don't know. That's a good question. I think for me, it comes down to the perfect body is is a art, right? It's it's an artistic idea. It's not an attainable idea, right? You're, there's, nobody's going to go out there and and think that Van Gogh's Lilies is a legitimate place you can go walk around. It's an idea of a place. I think we do the same thing with the the perfect body type and take that fear and that hatred of every other type out of it by saying, okay, well, this is this is the the beauty that can be achieved by a painting. Most of those pictures and most magazines are total paintings because they're so photoshopped, they're not even real. So we see it as art. I think if we can see that stuff as art, we start to take the sting and the stigma and the hate and the fear out of it and, and start to see it more as just beauty. I don't know any other way to put it. But I think that would take a cultural change because there's, there's, there's a lot of elements that go into why people are overweight. But I, I think th- I think we need a cultural change for that. Be, you know, it'll take a while because, you know, people are going to tease people who are fat or too skinny or too short or too tall. So they're going to get teased when they're younger, you know. And then there's also – so one of the reasons why um, we are fatter now is nutritional. We have – Lots of fast food with chemicals that make us eat more and more of that stuff. And fast food is convenient and more available, while healthy food is less convenient, more expensive. You know, so there's a lot of things we can do to adjust people's decision making and habits. But, you know, it, it's got to start somewhere. So I wonder where it starts. I think it starts with, with what we're talking about on this, this particular topic of not teaching people to hate or fear somebody because they're different. Absolutely. So how do we do that? How do we teach somebody not to to have that fear and that hate? What do you think? Well, as far as the differences is concerned, if we're just talking about overweight people, there's plenty of overweight people around to be to say that you know someone who's overweight. I think it would help to teach people why some people end up overweight because if we, if we want compassion, compassion is not necessarily, you know, you can't wrap compassion up and then just put it in somebody's pocket and presto, it happens. It has to be something that happens over time. So I think the first step for people who are who are not overweight, if we're just sticking with this particular example, get more people to understand why people would be overweight. Because the message now is that you're overweight because you're you're lazy or you you eat too much or there must be something wrong with you to get that big. And that's one, that's not always the answer. And two, it goes back to the things we, that I said earlier about the things you eat, nutrition, the messages that are sent about the kind of food we eat. So I think it, one, we start with teaching people why people may be overweight instead of just letting everyone think that you're just fat and lazy. No, I agree. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to use my kids as an example again because they're the only thing I have. But my daughter, my oldest daughter, who's eight, 
came home from school earlier this school year and said that one of the little boys in her class was picking on her and making fun of her and calling her names. And her and I sat down and I asked her, I'm like, sweetie, why do you think he's picking on you and, and calling you names? And she sat for a second quietly and, and I could see the, the wheels turning and the contemplation in her head. And she looks at me and she goes, daddy, I just don't think he has enough love at home. I didn't know what to say after that. I'm like, maybe you're right, sweetie. So maybe we should find the compassion for him. And even though he's treating us badly, we show him compassion so that he can see that people can be good if he's not getting that love at home. I don't know if he was or wasn't. I don't know this kid. But for me, it was that idea of she has that instinctual compassion to see past the the pain and the suffering that she's being inflicted or that's being inflicted upon her, I should say. Mm -hmm. That's great. We should be able to instill all that in our kids. And I, I think it does start there. It starts with the lessons we are taught. You know, everything starts with education. And if we can get more people to impart this knowledge on the children, seeing past the surface, seeing past somebody's hurt, understand why somebody is different. If we're talking about overweight, help to understand that. If we're talking about a different type of minority, try to understand that, you know, because I'm part of a minority and my minority is misunderstood. I'm disabled. I'm so called, well, I'm blind and they call that disabled. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've faced, you know, ostracizing and discrimination and it's because people have been taught that if you have a certain uh, disability that you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that has been pervasive and maybe at some point, hundreds of years ago, maybe it was true, but it's no longer true. It hasn't been for quite some time. And so that also starts with education. So where do we find this education? Is this something we have to teach at home? Is this something that has to be garnered from the world around us? I don't, I don't know where we start with this. How do we find this education? Well, like you said, there's programs like this, which whoever's listening to it, that, hey, it's a start. I think that um, we certainly need to be more exposed to differences. Um, so the media plays a role in this because the media controls a lot of our perceptions because, you know, we can't be everywhere in the world at once. So the media does have a control on what we think about parts of the world we don't know anything about. And so I think the media plays a role in this as far as portraying differences in a better light in a more prominent light, making them mainstream. So it, it's, I don't know, I don't have a one shot deal answer for you, but it, it, because it takes, it takes a whole, it takes a lot of the system to work together. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of it too has to do with, I think as, as generations go and we become a more evolved society, I've noticed that my generation, my grandmother's generation, my wife's grandmother actually is, is the one that helped me see this idea. But there's racism is, is changing drastically from, from my, my wife's grandmother's generation. She's 90, I think, to our generation. And even my kids' generation is, is having a huge impact on the idea of racism. We go to visit my wife. She, my wife's grandmother, she lives in Florida and she owns a cattle farm. And she was talking to us when she actually was a, working cattle farm, how she would let, she was so kind to the, the workers of color because she would let them come on the porch and have lemonade after their shift. And that was her idea of being kind to them, right? And, and our ideas have changed so much. Our generation now, we see everybody as equal. It doesn't matter color, race, creed, religion, everything. I think we see more equality in people and even more so in my kids' generation. I think even more so now in that generation because our generation is imparting that onto them. So I think it can be a natural progression as we start to become more enlightened as individuals. So I think it's going to be a natural thing. What do you think? Um, you know, it that sounds nice, but the, the, the equality that we're experiencing or the idea that people think everyone is equal now, we had to fight for that. Yeah. That was not a natural outcome. We had to fight for that. And it took hundreds of years over generations and cultures to little by little by little by little shift it. So I don't know how natural it is, but it certainly has happened where, where it's good to live in today versus 150 years ago. If you know, especially if you're a so-called not, you know, non-mainstream. But I, I just, you know, when it comes to race, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to all these different uh, categories, you, people had to fight and risk a lot to change the system just a little bit in their lifetime. I agree. Maybe natural wasn't the right word for that, but it's it's something that has, there's always been somebody willing to fight for that with, and risk their, their selves to gain that. 
so maybe natural, I guess you're right. Natural is the wrong word for that. There, it's always been a fight. It's always been a struggle. But I think now it's it's less so than it has been. Well, um, yeah, d- yes, I, I think so. I think there's some things that there's some levels of acceptance when new minorities make themselves known. Well, not new, but when minorities make themselves known, because all the things we debate now in, in the media have always been there, you know, so they just making themselves known now. And it seems like we accept things faster, which I think is a good thing. But there's definitely still more work to do. I, I think that uh, we still have more work to do, like like you said, on the obesity thing, uh, as far as turning that whole ship around. I still think we have a lot to do as far as uh, relieving the discrimination around disabilities. So we've come a long way. I definitely give you that. But it's definitely been a fight. So are we fighting out of, of I don't know, I don't know how to... How do we find a better way than fighting? I don't. I hate the idea of of seeing everything as a fight because when you're fighting, it's you against somebody else, right? And I, I hate the idea of all the minorities and and all the people who feel downtrodden and like the society has stepped upon them, feeling like they have to to fight because then it, it you're inherently put in a me against you mentality. Is there a better way in, in your mind that we can come about this versus a, a fight? I wish. That may not be a positive answer for you. I don't know. It doesn't have to be positive. I just want truth. That's what I'm seeking. I, I wish. I wish. Because, you know, this is because everybody, you know, the funny part is everybody believes that their view is the right view. Everyone believes that, you know, and so everyone is going to advocate for their point of view. And often point of views are, you know, opposite. So if someone sincerely believes one thing and we see it as discrimination, so we believe the opposite, if we don't fight, I always say that if we don't, if we tolerate intolerance, then the intolerance wins. Yeah. Yeah. And and if we don't fight against people who they may really believe what they do when it comes to certain levels of discrimination, but it's going to be us versus them or he versus she, it unfortunately breaks down to that because everyone believes they're right and everyone wants their view to be the 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 moral of the day so you don't think that this is something we could accomplish through compassion and and instead of fighting for our our view we say hey i i agree with your view i know you have not agree but i know you have your view i can recognize your view now let me give you my view, my take on it. Here's my story of of what I had to go through as as disabled or a minority. Here's my struggle. Here's what I had to go through and and live with daily that you haven't. Now now that you have this information, what do you think? Is that not a different way that we could approach that versus a fight versus battle? I'll ask you. I'll I'll go with that, and I'll ask you a question. Let's say I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a couple of hot categories. Just to give an example. So let's say I'm I'm going to give you two. One, if I tell you, okay, well, um, I'm blind. And because of my blindness, society has done this, 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 this. And then somebody says, well, you know, uh, being blind is, you know, you're at higher risk being blind and because you can't see. Sight is the most important uh, sense. So, you know, we think it's best if you, if someone takes care of you. Um, What do you say? I've shared my views. They shared their views. Who wins? So the next scenario, right? I tell now this is, you know, I'm just giving an example. I'm not gay, but I'm going to use the word. I'm going to use the gay label, even though I'm not gay. So I'm going to say, um, I'm gay and society has stepped on me and blah, blah, blah. And this has happened to me and I'm suffering. And someone else can come back and go, well, to according to my moral beliefs, you know, you're doing, you're doing sinful activities and we can't allow you to, to participate in certain areas. So what do you do? You, you, both of you shared your viewpoints. One, one viewpoint has to prevail. I agree. And I think one viewpoint will always prevail, but I I think you've you've opened up a different can of worms now because I think no offense to any religion, but I think religion has, has been inherently destructive to this idea of, of fear and hate. You can't have a successful religion if you're not preaching fear and hate. And, and to me that that's where that, that problem lies is because we'll go back to the, the gay thing because Christianity teaches gays are sinful, gays are bad, gays are terrible. We have to then hate them and fear them and and essentially destroy them or turn them back to what we'll call normal, right? Because the normal thing is straight. And mm-hmm. to me, that that is where that that struggle comes from is be, is the heavy religion that people 
spit out on, on that whole topic. And I think the same thing with disability to an extent, right? Because I don't, I don't, I'm not a biblical scholar by any stretch, but I know that there is some point, or I think anyway, there's, there's a part in the Bible that talks about how disabilities are, has something to do with past sins or something. I don't remember. Yeah. Disabilities are past sins. There's a lot of people that believe, especially in other countries, aside from the U S that if you're born disabled, you know, something your parents did, um, or you're cursed, and, you know, or, you know, you have the devil in you. People here um, in, the, in the U.S., they use disability as a sympathy thing. Like, you know, Jesus made the blind see and the lame walk. So now you're viewed as inadequate and that Jesus is supposed to heal you. Um, and if somebody helps you, they're doing the Lord. There's a whole lot of religious backed separatist thing when it comes to disability. So I don't know how we overcome all that just by sharing ideas. I, I think there has to be one thing that overrules the other thing at some point, because you can't have two different policies in the same area at the same time. I agree. And and that may not be the, the solution. Unfortunately, I wish it was. I would love to say that just coming together and, and sharing ideas could, could solve the world's issues. I guess that's my utopian view of the world. Well, yeah, I, I would love it to be that way, but then are you saying that we should all be the same? Because in order to think the same, we'd have to all be the same, I guess. I know. I don't think we should all be the same. I think that's, that's the beauty of, of the idea of getting rid of, of fear and hate is you don't have to be the same because if I no longer fear you and I no longer hate you for being different, then your being different is okay. And your being different is acceptable. And your being different can even be celebrated just as my difference can be celebrated. Who's to say that because I'm not blind, that I'm better or worse or any different. I'm just have a different ability. And I don't think there's anything that should be degraded or celebrated on either case. I'm with you. I'm in your camp. I'm doing a little bit of devil's advocate for you. Because I'm in your camp, I'm going to, I have to do devil's advocate or else this will be a very boring podcast. I agree. <laughs> so, cause I'm, I just, I just want to let you know that I'm, I'm on your side. I'm not real. I'm not religious. I'm closer to Buddhist than anything else of these name brand religions. I'm all with you. But I, 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 and when you talk about the beauty of being different versus fear and hate, I always say this. If you want people to be different, but yet not hate each other, then where's the limit that you put on each other's differences? Like, you're so then you're saying that I can only be as different as you think I should be. If you're saying that I can't have my viewpoint, which is which opposes yours and excludes you, then you're telling me I can only be different under your limits. I think that's that's where a lot of the, the problem lies too. Is is we have to view things as as limited. One of the things I used to teach in my anger management classes, or one of the, not teach, but one of the things I found is people who are angry and violent and controlling have a view of the world as limited. There's only so much love. There's only so much compassion. There's only so much joy. And if if my wife or girlfriend or fiance or friends are getting it somewhere else, then I can't give it to them. And I'm not adequate enough because I'm not the one providing it. I think we need to get rid of of the idea of there's only a finite amount of things of of love of joy of compassion of of care and realize it's an infinite level you can you can take that as far as you want to go with it and be as accepting as you could possibly dream of being well I mean all right well do you think that everyone has a right to see the world in that in a way that resonates with them I think as long as you're not harming or stopping anybody else from doing the same yes completely okay. So you would limit some practices or some people's beliefs around religion, because that's where a lot of discrimination comes from. I agree with you there. So you would tell people you can only be but so religious. <sighs> when you say it that way, it makes it sound really bad. But I would almost say, yeah, if, if your religious view is causing you to harm or degrade or belittle another person or another race, another minority, then yeah, it needs to be limited. All right. So, but, but here's, here's another one for you. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm with you, but I, I gotta, I think I love these debates because it gives me a chance to say things I don't normally get to say because I don't have a, my talk show is not about this. So this is cool. These cultural issues. Uh, so what do you call discrimination? So let's say, let's stick with the religious thing. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, the gay thing is low hanging fruit because it's a hot issue. It's very clear and cut and dry so we can work with it. Sure. So where does my, right to be religious end. So let's say that I say, I love all people because God made them. And the Bible, you know, says, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, but I just don't want these gay people getting married. I don't want them having kids. I don't want them living next to me, but I love them because they're human. So where does my preferences end and discrimination begins? 
For me, it's it's the idea of limiting what somebody can do, where they can go, just based on something they can't control. Gender, sex. Ah, you're getting down to a bigger divide. Some people think that you choose to be gay. Yeah, some people do yeah, choose that. You, I, see, I, you I, see how it goes. Yeah. You see how it goes on sure. and on and on and on. But then, damn. I hate when I get backed in a corner like that because you're right. It, it, some people do. I'm not trying to. No, no, no. I love it. Back me in a corner. I think it's great. But I think you're right. I think some people do view sexual orientation as a choice. And and that becomes the issue there is, is it a choice? Is it something you choose? I don't think it is. Personally, I, I think you're born who you are. I don't think so. I don't think you choose it either. But if we're talking about people with different opinions, some people have opposite opinions than you and me. Yeah. 180. Oh, yeah. They they think Brokeback Mountain was a recruiting movie for gay people. I'm serious. Some people thought this. Really? Wow. Yes. Some people on the, you know, I don't want to be too overly political, but some people, of course, on the far right thought that this was a recruiting movie. They thought the Teletubbies from the 90s were gay. I have heard that before. And that, yeah, that's. Yeah. So there are people who believe that you choose your sexuality. God doesn't make any mistakes, as they quote it. And there are people who sincerely believe you love you. Gay is a sin, but you love the sinner. You know, he's a human, but he's still sinning. He's still gay. You know, so there are people who have 180 views from you and I. So what do we do? Do they have a right to think? I think everybody has a right to think. I, I, that's where I want to. I, I don't want to be come. I can't think of the name of the movie. I think it's Minority Report or something where you're judged based on your thought, thought crime, right? I, I don't want to get to that point in society. I think you're allowed to think whatever you think. If you want to think that, that gay people make that choice and that, that obese people make the choice to go eat six cheeseburgers from McDonald's, you have that belief. You have that thought process all you want. For me, what the, where the line is drawn is when you start acting upon those thoughts to harm or to belittle or to degrade uh, that person. Uh, there's another thing. What if I'm religious, right? I'm I'm, I'm a straight, I'm going I'm to go with the stereotype. I don't want to offend anyone, but I'm a straight white Christian male. And I believe that gay people raising kids is unhealthy and it's against law and against God's and against God's word. So I'm going to stop these gay people from getting married and having families because that's not the way families are supposed to be. And I believe it's for the betterment of the children. I really don't believe it's it's harming anyone. The children are more important. And instead of this sinful lifestyle that you choose anyway. I can, and I really believe that. I, I, can, I, I was raised that way. My mother was the bishop of the church. And I can see somebody having that, that idea and that belief. And, I, and I've actually, I've seen a lot of people who have that belief. And for me, it's always the idea of, is it better to be raised by no parents or is it be better to be raised by same-sex parents? I think any time – because morality isn't bought by sexual orientation, right? Gay people and straight people are no more moral than anybody else or less for that matter. So to me, it's, it's the idea of a family is a family is a family. If you're raising a child in a loving, healthy, respectful environment, it doesn't matter if it's if the child is brought up with two mommies or two daddies or a mommy and a daddy or one mommy and or one daddy. It's it's irrelevant. You can raise a healthy child in any type of environment. It's about loving and accepting and showing that child compassion. Yeah, I agree with you. But that means you and I would then, I guess, in theory, stop people who would disagree with us from implementing their thoughts and running for office and winning office and carrying out their legal versions of their thoughts. So you and I then would stop them from from carrying out their, their right to do what they want. That means we wouldn't be electing them. We would think you're crazy for voting for someone who thinks like that. We would do everything we can do to stop them from carrying out their beliefs. And I think that is is the ideal solution for it is – but then that's a fight. It is a fight. But it's – it's we're always – as you said, there's always going to be a fight. And I, I really want that not to be the case. I really, really do. But it's always going to be the case. And I, I think the winner of the fight in any any fight should be the one on the side of equality, compassion, empathy, respect, love. That should always be the victor. I think it always will be the victor over time. Right. I, th I think we're slowly seeing a diminishing level of hate and, and fear and bigotry and all of these things in our society. It's slowly, but it's I think it's coming along. Well, yeah, it reminds me, I don't want to misquote him, uh, Martin Luther King, who said something something to the effect of the, the, the arc of justice is a very long arc. Like we bend towards the right thing. It just takes a long time. 
I agree, sadly. Um, so I want to give you the chance for the, the last word on, on the idea of are we born with fear and hate or is it taught? What do you think? You know, I, I actually like, you know, the beginning. Um, I started out talking about how there's instinctual fear, which is meant to protect our lives um, versus the taught fear, which, you know, can be used to be negative. And so I I agree with you that the the fear is not is not is not uh you're not born with the kind of fear that we've been talking about but i do think you are born with an instinctual presence of 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 uh, well presence of mind i don't because i think i don't know if it's presence of mind but i think you have an automatic instinct to be afraid of things that look like they're gonna end your life but most of the things we're talking about accepting others doesn't end your life so we definitely have been taught that and we misuse that but um so yeah, I guess I'm saying two things at once. <laughs> and I, I understand what you're saying. It, it's we're born with self preservation. We're not born with hate. We're not born with with a fear of others. Yeah, you know, and I think self preservation is an excellent word. Um, but if you if you, you and you can say running from a lion is self preservation, but um, discriminating against someone comes more from, I guess, the word fear that we've been using it in. So that's good. That's a good way of differentiating the two. Awesome. Well, I, I love it. I think it was a, a very interesting, although albeit uh, off on the rails a few times, but that's all right. That's what this was for. So before we go, though, I want to give you a chance to, to tell everybody where they can find you. I know you said you had a, a podcast or a show. Give everybody a link to that. There'll also be a link to that in your guest page on the website when we finally launch. But go ahead and if you will, just give everybody that information now. Hey, sure. So if you want to listen to my podcast, it um, has to do with men building core self-confidence and being the authentic selves. So you can go to coreconfidencelife.com. So you can check out the podcast, the articles, some of the services that we offer at Core Confidence Life. So there you go. Coreconfidencelife.com. Awesome. Well, Dennis, it was a very interesting conversation. Hopefully, if you're willing to, I'd love to have you on again to do it again for a different topic. Yeah, I love this stuff. You know, one of my, my very first podcast was a political show. And so, um, but now it's not. I don't, so I don't get the chance to talk about these kind of cultural issues the way we have been. So it's been cool. Thank you again. This has been Dennis Sumlin with us, guys. And thank you for joining us. Okay, so there it is. Is it philosophy? Go to our website at www.isitphilosophy.com and leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter and Facebook as well. Help us grow by going onto iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts and subscribe. And take a moment and leave a review. Until next time, question everything, seek your truth, and don't be afraid to speak your truth. Mm-hmm.